How's it going, my math people? It's Alan here, your friendly trig instructor, going over this new concept of identities. Okay, we're going to start with the fundamental identities here first. So let's get to it. Now, these often seem to challenge students for whatever reason, um, and I believe that there's two. The first, it's going to test your algebra skills. Okay. But now, obviously, we're going to be using our trig knowledge along with our algebra skills. Okay, so all the things that we've learned previously, we're going to couple with algebra in order to rewrite and hopefully simplify expressions. Typically, we'll get to the equation stuff a little bit later on. Okay, and therefore, there's just a lot to memorize. So that's what my take is on some of the things that challenge students in this chapter in particular, which some seem to think is one of the most difficult ones in this entire class. Okay, so what our quest is going to be for doing these is when and which of all these different, we're going to call identities, are going to be used. And of course, how they're going to be used. And again, easier said than done, but with you guys working through these, practicing diligently, and being okay with making mistakes, okay? Some of these you're gonna make mistakes on, but as long as you don't give up, go back, that's a part of learning and gaining that knowledge, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and start you off with defining what an identity actually is. And you guys have probably heard of identity theft before. And that's when somebody's trying to steal your identity in order to create some type of personal or financial gain. All right? So why do we call it identity theft? Because they're trying to be identical to you. How does this translate to trig? Well, what math symbol do we use to denote that two things are indeed identical? one of the first ones that you actually learned besides the digits or numbers and that would be the equal sign so when we're talking about identities we're just talking about two things that are equal say a and x okay so let's start with a few of these identities that we're going to be talking about which remember are the fundamental identities and the first ones we're gonna look at are called reciprocal identities. And again, you should already know a lot of these, it's just now we're putting them with names. So the reciprocal identities would be, for example, well, remember they're called reciprocal identities for a reason, they are simply the reciprocal of our big three trig functions, sine, cosine, and tangent, respectively. So to prove it to you one more time, if you've forgotten, remember, Sine is always the y over the r. So I'm replacing what I know that is equivalent to. And since they're called reciprocal identities, then we know that cosecant, according to this, they are identical or equivalent, should be equal to r over y. Well, remember the one thing that we can always multiply to not change what we have is one. So I'm gonna multiply by a fancy one of r over y to that fraction in pink there. Because when I do that, I can see that some things start canceling out. The y over the y becomes a one, and the r over the r becomes a one. So this entire denominator is a big one. And when I multiply one times something, I get r over y. So we do, in fact, see that this is equivalent to this because we know by definition we've discussed it many times over that those are what we call reciprocal functions of one another now in this chapter we're just calling them identities okay so i'm not going to do that for every one you can definitely do that if you'd like but in this case i'm just going to give you what these are equivalent to, which for secant, remember read it right to left and you can kind of see cosine there. So we know that it is the 
reciprocal, one over cosine. Cotangent, easiest one, one over tangent. So these are our reciprocal identities that we're gonna have to quote unquote memorize. Now I put air quotes because you should already know these. This is nothing new. Same thing with these quotient identities, the next ones here. Quotient identities are when we have a quotient, a division, a fraction. And so hopefully you remember that both tangent and cotangent could be written as two other trig functions being divided. Now remember we said cotangent and tangent were the y over the x and therefore the reciprocal function x over y. And if you remember, when dealing with the unit circle, sine was always equal to y over r and cosine x over r. And if we're on the unit circle, then we knew that the r was one. And therefore cosine was equal to x and sine equal to y. And therefore we can write our y simply as sine of that same angle over our x, which was cosine of that same angle. And this is what we also have spoken about earlier on in the class. So cotangent would just be the reciprocal of that. So cotangent starts with cosine on top over sine. Stuff, again, that we should already have known, but now we're calling them identities. So quotient identities only apply to tangent and cotangent. Reciprocal identities only to the reciprocal functions. Okay, although we can flip those and say that, for example here, uh, cosine, if I flip that, put it over one, would be equal to one over secant. Okay, so you can do that for the big three as well if you wanted to know what they were equivalent to. But now I'm gonna to get to the Pythagorean identities. And what do you think comes involved with the Pythagorean identity? You guessed it, the Pythagorean theorem. So I'm gonna just prove this to you real quick one time, and then we will memorize it. So let's say we had our X and Y axes, and again, we're on some circle here. Let's choose some point, we'll call it point P. And I'll just play in quadrant one, because I know how to get to that point would be over some X and up some Y value. An ordered pair, we call it. And that would create, therefore, a right angle. And of course, this is trig after all. I could go ahead and draw in one extra piece from the center of my circle out to that point P. And we'll go ahead and call that R because that would represent the radius of the circle. And therefore we know that we can take our leg squared plus our other leg squared and set it equal to our hypotenuse squared, which is R. And that is the Pythagorean theorem. But what we're gonna do is try to get these into identities using all of our trig functions. So remember that we just reviewed cosine was x over r, sine is y over r. And we said that this is the unit circle, so we would prefer this to be equal to one, our radius. So what can we do to any equation? Well, anything we want, really, as long as we do it equally. So if I wanted to divide every single one of these pieces, let's say by r squared, so that I get this to equal one. Then what would be left here would be x over r squared, so I don't have to write it twice. Plus, then this, since they're both being squared, would be y over r squared. And therefore, we just reviewed it. We know that cosine is x over r, well then I can replace this with cosine of, let's call this angle theta. 
Now remember, we don't put the square there because then we'd have to keep the parentheses around it. So instead, we said that we would go ahead and put it there so that we don't have to write the parentheses and still denote that what is being squared. Not the angle, but the function cosine of that angle. Okay. Plus my other one, which we know y over r is always equal to sine squared. And that, my friends, is the Pythagorean identity. Now I say the because there is more than one, and also we could manipulate this two other ways. We could go ahead and subtract over the cosine or subtract over the sine so that we would have each one of these individually and know what they are, okay? So again, I'm gonna write these down for you. I'll give you all of these in a nice form or fashion, but I wanted to kind of derive and talk you through them first. So a lot of times we'll start with sine squared plus cosine squared. We're adding, so it doesn't really matter. Of some angle equals one. And that's the one I want you to make sure that you definitely memorize. Any of these other ones will just make it a little bit easier for you moving forward. Okay, but that's the one you have to memorize because if you know that one, you can come up with the others. And here's how. All we have to do is take this and just like we did over here where we divided the whole equation equally to every part by r squared, we can do that to this equation as well as long as we do it equally to everything. So if I want to get something other than sines and cosines, which by the way we saw when graphing were our two favorite, but if we had tangents, cotangents, secants, cosecants involved, well then how can I get those? Well obviously I can divide all of this by either cosine squared and see what I get, or we'll do it again but with sine squared. So what do we get when we divide everything by cosine squared theta? Well, you can see this first part would just be a nice one. Then what do we just get done reviewing sine over cosine is? Well, take a look right up here. That was tangent. And since they're both squared, that means we're going to write this as tangent squared of that angle theta. And now it's not equal to one. But again, we just reviewed what is one over cosine equivalent to. Hopefully you remember that is secant. So since it's squared on bottom, this would be our alternative version. There is a second. And of course, again, since this is equivalent to secant squared, what if I wanted to know what it was for just tangent squared? I have that by itself. Well, I could go ahead and subtract over the one and get just tangent squared, okay? So two different variations off of these. Um, you could even subtract over the tangent squared and get it equal to one as well, okay? So what would we do again one more time to this to try to rewrite it once more? Well, instead of dividing everything by cosine squared, we could divide everything by sine squared. Now notice I'm not saying the angle theta every time, but you have to have that there. I'll make a note of it later. Okay, so when we divide now this by sine squared, what is cosine over sine of the same angle? Remember we just reviewed that as well. That would be cotangent squared of that angle. And then when we divide anything by itself, that is simply just a one and it's positive. And then one over sine squared would be our cosecant squared theta. So there are our three various Pythagorean identities, which of course all stemmed from the one I told you you have to memorize by simply dividing either everything by sine squared to get that one or cosine squared to get that. And like I mentioned, 
You can also move things over to the other side of each and every one of these to get any of the other pieces by themselves. Hopefully that makes sense. You're able to follow along with it. Now we're just going to have to work with either flashcards or whatever you do to help you memorize each and every one of these. There's one more set of identities that we're going to talk about, and those are called the even odd identities. Okay, so you can see my drawing over here has both a positive angle, we're going to call theta, and if we did the opposite of that, that would just be negative. Now this goes into quadrant two, quadrant three, or even four for our angle theta, but then I would have had to have gone negatively to quadrant two, quadrant three, or four. And that just takes up more time and effort, and it gets a little bit ugly. So I'm just gonna stay in quadrant one and kind of talk to you about even versus odd, okay? And what we're really looking to do is basically get rid of any negative angles. We much prefer positive people excuse me, positive things, okay? So with this, um, we're gonna be looking to get rid of negative angles. So when we talk about these, we're looking for sine of an angle, cosine of an angle, tangent of an angle. And I'll start with the big three and then we'll talk about their reciprocal functions as well. And what we're looking to get rid of is a negative angle. If we don't have to work with negative people, sorry, I keep telling it, negative things, then we'd rather not. So if I don't have to go in the negative direction, I'd rather go with a more comfortable positive. Now, of course, you think of negatives and positives, you should also be thinking of all students take calculus in order to see what's positive and what's negative in those quadrants. And so for the first one here, I'll do a sign. Let's say we had to evaluate the sine of negative theta. Now, of course, that negative theta is gonna put us to this point right here, which since it's sine, we know in quadrant four, it would be negative. But what's not changing, hopefully you notice, what's not changing is the size of the angle. Whether I drop this down here or I drop that down there, it would be the same right angle with the same x and the same y distance. So when I evaluate that trig function, it's going to give me the same y over r. Just one's going to be positive and one's going to be negative, which we already knew because of this. So what we can say is equivalent to the sine of negative theta is simply negative of sine of theta. Hopefully that makes sense. And of course, we're gonna call that either an even or an odd, and you can probably guess which. If the score is even in a game, it usually means it's the same. And you can see that these two did not come out the same. This one is actually the opposite, okay? Just like if I gave you the number five, you would tell me the opposite of that is negative five. So the symbol we use for opposite math is negative. So we're looking to rewrite these as positive angles. But we need to see whether it's going to be a positive or negative in front, if that's what we're dealing with. Okay? So the next one here, let's go to cosine. But again, we're dealing with negative theta to start, which we know would be equivalent to positive, as would if we just evaluated theta without the negative. It too would be positive for cosine. So for this one, we do get the same thing out. So we are going to call this an odd and this an even. And it also has to do with their graphs. Now tangent, you can probably look at this pretty easily now and see, well, it's gonna be negative here, and if I just did theta, it would be positive there. So they're going to be opposites, and therefore what we call an odd function, right? So what do you think would happen with the reciprocal functions? Would that change 
any of these things for any one of these? No. So therefore, I can just rewrite these the same way I did with the others, and hopefully you would be able to say now with confidence that this would just be equivalent to negative cosecant of that angle theta. Or secant, because it is cosine, then it would be positive of that angle theta. Whether you write the positive or not, it's totally up to you. And then cotangent is tangent, so that would be negative in that quadrant four for that angle. All right, so those are our even versus odd identities. And if you can see, there are only two even, but there are twice as many, no pun intended there for the even, twice as many odd. All right, so this only helps us when we have large negative angles. We can just take the sign out, basically, whether that's positive or negative, and evaluate the angle by itself because we know we'd get that same ratio for each and every one of those. The only thing that will change are their signs. So here they are all together. If you wanted to take a nice snapshot of that, now that I've kind of derived them all with you, so that you have them all in one place for your notes. Only thing I might add in here is to denote that these are the even, and these are the odd identities. Don't forget, this one here is the Pythagorean identity that you can then use to come up with either of these. And remember, we can also manipulate these to subtract anything over that we want in order to solve for any other specific thing. Okay? What's really nice, if you notice, that we can rewrite every single one of these fundamental identities, they're calling them, in terms of sine and cosine. So keep that in mind. That is something that we will utilize throughout this entire chapter. So before we get to example one, I wanted to make a few more notes, just as things that I've mentioned already, but to make sure that you guys all have in your notes and in words. Okay. As we've already spoken about, theta represents an angle and can therefore be in degrees or radians, that real number. Okay. Now, most of the time when they use theta, they're going to say that it's an angle in degrees. And when they use x, then it's our radian or real number. All right. But it can represent either, so make sure you pay attention to that and especially when you're using your calculator because you will have to change from degrees to radians. Okay. The other big one that I wanted to mention, depending on the situation, you may have to manipulate the Pythagorean or any of these identities. Okay. So what this whole chapter is going to be about, a lot of manipulation and using our algebraic techniques and rules within trig now in all of these different identities things that we know that are equivalent. One of the big ones that students do all the time that really is a sin is that they don't write the angle, right? You cannot evaluate a trig function without the angle, okay? So again, use my joke here to remind yourself that you never want to sin and you have to put something following that. Otherwise, it is simply that it's a sin okay and it can cost you you need something after each one of those angles so please when you're writing these down do not put it like this even though i know what you mean and you can probably work it out and know what you mean make sure that you are writing it with the angle measurement whether that's theta or x all right so now that we have all of this down Let's go and try to see if we can apply it. So the first thing they give us is the fact that cosine theta is equal to 5 eighths. And they're even telling us that theta is in quadrant 4. Because remember, where cosine is equal to 5 eighths could have been in 
any of these quadrants that are positive. And I say positive only because that's what they gave us here, was that cosine is equal to 5 eighths. So right then and there, we should have known it was not in quadrants 2 or 3. And so is it in quadrant 1 or 4? They have to give us something else to work with. And in this case, they flat out told us, you just need to know how to read Roman numerals. 1 before 5. So that's 4. So we know right then and there that we are not in this quadrant, and we're going to be building this to get to some point. Now, I'm going to go ahead and draw it. doesn't really matter if it's to scale, but you do have to place them in the proper places, meaning that we know cosine of any angle is always equal to the x over the r. Now, be very careful when you're labeling these things. Something I like to always do right off the bat is just tell myself what direction these things are. And I know from here, that is a positive direction, and that is a negative direction. And we know our radius is always some distance, so it's always going to be positive. So what I like to do is put this is positive something, this is negative something, and this is always positive something. And then I'll go and actually plug in what those are based off of what they told me. And they told me that the x is 5. And the r is therefore 8. And so in order to find sine for that same angle theta, tangent for that same angle theta, and negative angle, uh-oh, but of secant, I already have that angle theta. And I could actually answer this before I answer these. So go ahead and pause it real quick and see if you can come up with this before we actually derive how to find these. Hopefully you gave that a shot because two things, two identities that we're going to use is the fact that we know that secant of any angle is equal to one over cosine of that angle. And we just reviewed that cosine of a negative angle is equal to the positive case of that same angle. So as long as I can find, co find cosine, wait a minute. You know what? They gave me cosine. So since this is just the reciprocal, I know that it's equivalent to secant of theta which since they gave us cosine of theta is 5 eighths, then I know my answer to this is merely 8 fifths for the reciprocal. Now, I didn't have to do anything else. I didn't have to do any of this to come up with that. That was simply using the fact that I know that this is the reciprocal of cosine and the negative angle for cosines and therefore secant is equal to the positive of that same value, theta. All right? So how are we going to find part A and B? What do we know sine theta is always equal to? Hopefully you said y over r. That's got to be ingrained in your brain by now. Tangent, y over x. And they actually gave us the x and the r. So the one thing that we are missing is the y. So how are we going to find that? And don't forget two things you should already know is that tangent and sine of this angle, because we're in quadrant four that they told us, we know our answer should come out negative something because of this quadrant, which is either done at the beginning like I just did, or you can make sure that you put it there and you'll still get that negative y value that we're going to find right now. And how are we going to do that? How are we going to find that missing leg of this triangle? Well, as long as it's a right triangle, and we know two out of the three parts, then we can use our Pythagorean theorem. Just be very cautious when doing it, and do not always put whatever the missing piece is as the c squared. So it's going to be my two legs squared equals the hypotenuse squared always. And our hypotenuse, hopefully you can see, is not 
the thing that we're looking for. It's eight. It's known. The other two legs, one of them is five, and we'll call it the y value, is the one that we don't know. So squaring that, you get 25 plus y squared equals 64. And then solving, we'll go ahead and subtract over the 25 to get our y squared is equal to nine and a three. Not very nice. And how should we have known it wasn't very nice? This was not a Pythagorean triple that we talked about. The three, four, five, five, 12, 13, eight, 15, seven, all those different ones that we talked about. The reason we've spoken about them and even listed them was because they are special, right? Just like all of you. So keep that in mind. Most of the time, yes, you will actually get a nasty square root. We call it an irrational number. So this would be our y equals the square root of 39. Now, if you can, they're going to want you to break these down into smaller factors. And if you can pull out and simplify it, make it a smaller number, then do it. But in this case, we know that those are both prime numbers. But we do have everything we need in order to now answer our question, which originally was finding the sine of this angle theta, which we know is the y over the r. So our negative we already have, just in case. I didn't want to make a mistake. Square root of 39 over my r, which was 8. And then tangent we know is the y over the x or opposite over adjacent. So again, I got my negative already there. So I would just put the square root of 39 again over this time five. And that's it. Not too bad, like a big puzzle, but in reality there was only one missing piece and that was the y. We were given the x and the r and we just had to make sure that we were in the proper quadrant to get what things are positive and what things are negative.